Yeah, for the walk that we had in um, in Nova Scotia, which we can also call Lake Mahi. It's Lake Mahi territory that we were walking through. Um, happened in September, and our idea for doing it happened just a year earlier, end of August, a year earlier, at a Voice of Women for Peace retreat, which um, Jill Carr Harris, who's also on the call tonight with us, was um, present. And we talked about the need. At that point, we wanted to, um, to actually go a couple of months later and challenge the Defense and Security conference with all the weapons makers in Halifax that happens annually. So we thought we would do a walk to, to that uh, arms fair and we would do an action and we would contrast the need for peace and the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, to be signed and, and contrast that with this weapons fair. Now it turned out that two months was too short of a timeline to try to do, to do our walk. Uh, but we got started. Jill actually traveled to Nova Scotia, visited people throughout the region to make contacts for um, our leader planning. And uh, so it's been a development over the year with uh, support from volunteers. It's all volunteers that have organized and planned the walk and uh, participated in the walk and are now carrying on looking forward from, from the walk. Uh, and so I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about it. And I, I could uh, just show this map if I can uh, screen share, but if I can screen share. No, nope. that screen share. So <laughs> uh, you can. Yeah. Can you share that? No, it says it's not turned on. Yeah. Okay. No, maybe I can share. Okay. So I don't know if everyone can see it very well, but we won't see it at all. Maybe it takes time to catch up. Okay, maybe this is not working. So I will skip that. I was gonna show you a map just to show where we started in Pugwash on the North shore of, of uh, Nova Scotia. And, and we traveled 200 kilometers, basically down the middle of Nova Scotia and arriving to um, Chibuktuk or Halifax in uh, in two weeks after we started. We had incredible weather. It was amazingly beautiful all the way along. So we were blessed uh, with that. And we had uh, an interesting, um, very diverse group of walkers with us. And um, this included and you'll see, you see, it's not that important that I show you the, the, the slide, any pictures right now because we're going to show you 16 minutes of a video that Jace Tanner made of our walk. And so what we want to do now is just give you the context around that. So I'm going to stop the sharing since it's not working anyway. And uh, we'll just go through. Mm -hmm. So um, we had with us four walkers from India. That includes Jill, one of our planners who lives in India. And she's in Europe right now, but she's with us and she'll be speaking a little bit later uh, about uh, the Indian part of, of our initiative, which was quite expensive. Uh, but here in Canada, we met uh, in, in Pugwash. I said, that's where we started. And the reason we started in Pugwash is that that is the place in 1957 where scientists first gathered in order to uh, try to 
restrain the nuclear arms race to try to de-escalate the threat that nuclear weapons was presenting. Um, there was a, a huge arms race after Second World War, after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And um, they, they really wanted to do their very best to um, prevent the destruction of which nuclear weapons are capable. So we wanted to start there. Uh, Pugwash was honored with a Nobel Prize, the Pugwash Thinkers Lodge, where the events were held um, in 1995. And we came back saying now the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has been honored with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. And, you know, 30 years later, some 30 years, we, we wanted to show that um, they're connected. And we want Canada to again become a leader in nuclear disarmament. Uh, so our mission was to bring an international group together to bring this to the public in Nova Scotia. We walked through um, all the, of the towns on our route. Um, and we were able to meet a lot of people on our walk. We, uh, we stayed in churches and community centers along the way. We made connections with Kairos, the Empire's Council, uh, with different churches. And um, uh, we were warmly welcomed along the way. Um, we were accompanied by two amazing Indigenous women uh, from um, in Jinbrook, who were Mi'kmaqi leaders, their grassroots grandmothers, who have done a lot of walking for water and water protection and other walks. So Mary and Amy joined us for the whole walk. Doreen joined us for the beginning of the walk. And in Pugwash, in particular, we had the opportunity to visit the high school, which in Pugwash has declared itself a nuclear weapons zone. So, and they wanted us to sign their uh, petition um, for the uh, to, to sign their pledge and support them in their initiative. Uh, so we had an assembly there, which we might hear a little bit more about later on. And then, um, you know, as I said, we were an international group, so I'll say a bit more about it. I said they were four from India. We also had. Um, a Buddhist drummer, Aikida, a monk from Japan. And, and he has walked from Hiroshima to Tokyo um, in, on many occasions, many years they've been doing this walk. And he joined us on our walk, um, beating his drum along with Miriam, who also her drum at the front of our walkers. We had between 15 and 20 walkers, sometimes a few more walkers. People joined us from Nova Scotia Voice Alone for Peace and um, brought their own thoughts, prayers, and uh, energy to our walk initiative. Um, so we walked. I was myself not a walker. I drove a van. So I drove a support van that provided uh, a place for people to put their belongings during the day so they wouldn't have to carry them. We also had other vehicles who came along with us who carried food and uh, and helped um, bury people as was needed from time to time. And so um, it was 13 day walk and we only had two down days, I think. And every day we were walking at least 20 kilometers and one day 30 kilometers. So they were big substantial um, walks and people were often tired at the end of the day. Now, nonetheless, on a few occasions, we were able to gather together after dinner and share. And those sharings were very precious as we learned more about each other's lives and why people had come and taken on this journey. Um, we we uh, did a fairly simple kind of food situation, but we had we were we were very happy to receive gifts of food from Gurdwaras that had. Um, uh, Jill might say a little bit more about later, she made the connection with them, um, who brought us meals on three occasions. And as we walked down through, um, from Hugwash, through sort of central Nova Scotia, central Mi'kma'ki, um, we stopped in Truro, and there we met with members of the Nova Scotia Black community, which is um, establishing a land trust, and the Indian um, participants in our walk uh, Jill's husband, Rajiji, and Jill are part of an organization that does land rights movement 
in India is a very significant part of their work. And in fact, it's this is where we took the technique of the long walk from. That methodology has been used now uh, on many occasions in India to advance land rights. Um, and we thought we will try here in Nova Scotia and see what we can do to raise our issues. We did have, um, have the opportunity to to uh, take along our petition, which I've also brought here tonight for people to sign, and I can send it out by email to others who might like to get signatures for the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We also had a very large petition signing board, which we brought to uh, these different communities and events that we had. And our final event was in Halifax on the 21st, or in Chibuktuk in uh, Big Maki. Um, and uh, that was a, an event that had many speakers and performers. It was the International Day of Peace, and that included um, included Senator Mary McFedrin and Robin Long from Pugwash, Canada. And they both spoke about the necessity for this treaty. And we, I think Jill's going to cover quite a lot more of what I have to say as well. Ellen is going to, to speak. And I believe uh, we also have Linda. We better make sure we get to in Linda before you uh, have to leave. So maybe we'll go with Ellen and then we'll go to Linda. That will work. I hope so. So thanks for allowing me to give that introduction to our adventure. It's, it's a one of a kind experience. It was very special. And um, we'll be, I look forward to speaking with you more informally after we hear um, the rest of the presentations. So over to you, Ellen Woodsworth is president or co-president of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in Canada. And we're delighted to have you among our other folks from Vancouver who were able to join the walk, including Joy Nasahara, who will speak after the film a little later. I'll come over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much for this great idea, Lynn, Catherine, Jill. It, it was really uh, very moving for us to shift from our on to Ottawa Peace Caravan, where we stopped in 17 cities across Canada and were joined from the Nova Scotia uh, VOW organization in Ottawa. And then I thought that uh, we would support your walk for peace in Nova Scotia. And it, I just thought we would be walking silently actually through the rural areas of Nova Scotia. So I was very excited that Jace Turner would join us, an amazing filmmaker. Uh, Masa came, Huguette came, who's um, with Phys International Physicians Against Nuclear War, Patsy George, the other co-chair joined us at the end. So we were all eagerly looking forward to um, meeting the people and in uh, Nova Scotia. And then all of a sudden, here's Jag Jagat talking about 52 peace walkers in India who want to join us and sharing about their organizing a thousand, hundreds of thousands of people walking for peace and social justice in India. So, and then we, you know, to be able to start off at the Thinker's Lodge where hundreds and hundreds of people have been since 1954 discussing how to prevent nuclear weapons and then to speak to you know youth in the schools and then the incredible warmth of the people of Nova Scotia was just striking to me I, they just came out of their houses they stopped on the side of the road they welcomed us in they provided washrooms they provided place to sit down for a little while and all the while, the drum of the Mi'kmaq grandmothers leading us on step after step after step for 200 kilometers. And, and then the, the, the Hindu temple came with food and the, the mosque opened it up us to a tea. And the, I mean, there were so many different groups that joined in whatever way they could. And I think inspired us all in, in the midst of the grave injustice and tragedy that's happening in uh, Gaza right now to think of other ways that we can stand up and speak out. And 
I was really, really uh, have to acknowledge Tamara Lawrence who's in on this and Ali for making sure that we had really important documents we could hang out, like uh, the role of NATO in this whole thing, the fact that the federal budget's going up to $49 billion and that the connection between climate disaster and militarism and, and petitions. And uh, we carried our banners when we had the strength and certainly put them at rallies that say demilitarize, decarbonize, decolonize. So it was um, a learning that I've taken away. And I think that when I got home, I was immediately asked to speak to a peace train that's going to be leaving Vancouver shortly that Jace will be part of. And then I learned that the National Council of Women had had a big rally on Parliament Hill. So people are wanting to call up for peace to address climate change and colonialism here and around the world. So I think this is just one more wave of people rising up. And I'm hoping that what we can do, and I think Joy will talk about a little bit later, is that we need to continue this at a local level and build towards a national walk for the spring where we all leave from wherever we are, walk as far as we can. We walk part of the Trans-Canada Trail in Nova Scotia. We can walk part of it here. And we can verge on Ottawa saying we want an agenda for peace. We want an agenda that works for all the people in the world. We do not want to follow the U.S. warmongering. We do not want to. Um, we want to work with China as a as a friends at, that want to stop the war in Ukraine and they want to stop the war in in uh, the Middle East. So there's so many things that started to bubble up for me that and we're ga we're given strength by the walkers and the people I met and the discussions that we have. So I'd, I'd really like to thank the leadership of bringing us all together. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we have an opportunity here from Linda Kalapatidis. Linda is a board member of Voice for Peace and a board and executive member of Science for Peace. And Linda was able to join us, and she was part of the disarmament education component of the work that we did. So I hope you'll uh, address that. Linda, thank you. Okay. Um, and oh, she got um, uh, Can you unmute her? Uh, Melissa? Uh, she is unmuted. She got to unmute herself. Okay, you have to accept that, Linda. Be unmute. There you go. Cool. Yeah. Unmute. Okay. We're good now. Oh. Thanks. Sorry about yeah. that. Uh, well, um, I've never been surrounded by so many inspiring people as a group, as individuals. I have no idea how anyone is navigating emotionally or intellectually through what is going on in the world without uh, working with with the he kind of people that 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 came together for this walk. It was such a privilege and an honor. And uh, uh, for me, uh, the um, the event uh, was uh, it was enriching in so many levels. But as far as uh, education, uh, peace and disarmament education, uh, which is something that I've I've worked on sort of in a silo for so many years. Uh, thanks to everyone who was a part of this, and in particular. Ali, Leah, and Catherine. Um, this was an incredible springboard that just launched uh, a multifaceted endeavor to spread peace and, and uh, disarmament curriculum uh, uh, across across the country and uh, hopefully even internationally. Um, since then, uh, we've had regular meetings. We were able to connect in uh, Dartmouth. Well, uh, Leah had the uh, the amazing experience uh, presenting and uh, in being having a very interactive presentation at uh, Pugwash. 
high school and uh, there was an elementary school visit as well. I was not able to enjoy it, to join until we went to Dartmouth. Dartmouth High School was an incredible experience because we connected not just with a room full of very keen and involved students who uh, I didn't even see a cell phone from the beginning to the end of the uh, interactive presentation, um, but afterwards connected with students and teachers alike, in particular two students who were all ready to plan a walk for next year and two teachers who were already doing peace and disarmament work but uh, they too had been working somewhat in silos and were so 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 excited to meet with us i've since uh uh, been able to communicate with them and uh, we have begun this network as a result of that uh, fantastic uh, springboard and the support of many organizations uh, including Science for Peace and VOW and IPPNW. So uh, it, it for me, although the walk is over, to me it, it really represented the uh, you know a huge step forward for uh, national and I actually really truly very soon envision it to be an international network for peace and disarmament education thanks to the incredible people that I work with. Thank you. <laughs> Um, maybe we could just uh, acknowledge some of the other uh, volunteers that came with us, and then we'll we'll move right on to the film. If that you can do that. Um, so one of them is here with us, Jane. Where are you, Jane? Oh, Jane Watson, somewhere. Yes, <laughs> Jane. Jane. Jane and I, and my sister Lee, and uh, her boyfriend Mike, we drove down in our EV electric vehicle um, from Toronto to, to Halifax, visiting many places along the way, including Cape Breton and other um, beautiful places, places we've never been. Uh, Jane came with us, and Jane was on the walk, and um, Jane did enormous work in the kitchen for us the second half of the walk. First half of the walk, Paul Hortz and Tuber um, did the, 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 the help with the, the food, and Jane really talked the second half of the walk. And as I said before, we had volunteers who came with their cars, a lot of Nova Scotia Voice of Women for Peace, and helped us. So we had a lot of help with the logistics, which was wonderful. Um, we're very grateful. We had two film workers with us. Um, we had um, in the last name of this, not remember, Harold yeah. and, and Veryl from, from Nova Scotia. And we had Jace Tanner. And Jace produced a, a film that we were able to show uh, on the 21st of September, International Day of Peace at, uh, in uh, Halifax at Dalhousie, and he's going to share it with you now. So, Jace, um, it was really a pleasure to get to know you during the um, caravan walk, and I'm so glad that you could come on our peace walk as well. Over to you. If he's there. I thought I saw him there before. There you are, Jace. Yeah, are you able to share? Yeah, I yeah. think uh, I think you can hear me now. It seems that uh, I couldn't unmute either until uh, one of the hosts did uh, did something to enable that. Anyway, thank you very much, and uh, it's good to uh, see everybody here virtually. I got here a little bit late. Um, so I've only got, you know, the sort of, uh, I don't have all the details about all of what's been said. So I'm going to make a point of not repeating too much. Um, I will only say that, um, as, as, a, um, uh, I heard Ellen say, you know, I did go on the, onto Ottawa caravan back in May. I will be leaving on a, on a peace train, uh, from Vancouver to Ottawa, uh, around the middle of November. And, um, and I'll be filming on that as I did on the caravan and of course this too. So my purpose is to create a documentary which I have uh, some high ambitions for and, and hopes for um, that perhaps will make it into theaters. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, so in other words, uh, what you're gonna see here is it, it, I do believe it's a, a representation of, of the walk in Halifax um, and the, what I'd like to also say is that it's um, a, um, a step towards uh, a more 
uh, encompassing look at the issue of uh, of militarization and nuclear war and all of the related issues that go with it. So with that, I can um, I can share the film if uh, if uh, if that's going to work. We'll see. I think it's going to work. Um, I'm just going to whoops no that didn't work. Bear with me, folks. I actually logged on once on my other computer, and that was a bit of a a disaster. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, hmm. Oh boy, what is going on here? It should be at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. But you know, I I uh, I hit it, and now I'm trying to unhide it, and the regular screen. Oh boy, it's not coming up. Why is it not coming up? Ah, okay. Here we are again. Hopefully, it'll work this time. Let's take a second to actually start the film. Can you change the settings or mostly can change the settings for the home screen of the film? Mostly change the settings so it's full screen for us of the film. <laughs> I'm not sure if you were asking me that. Um, the significance of starting in Pugwash yeah, I and because of Inker's Lodge, where big ideas was supposed to be thought through in, in the village of Pugwash, set up by Cyrus Eaton in the 50s, early 50s, and we had the great meeting of uh, for discussion of the Bertrand Russell Albert Einstein manifesto against nuclear weapons, which launched the first big effort to disarm. In 1957, this was a place where scientists came together to reduce the risk of nuclear war, to develop a framework of trees, uh, and to help us uh, live forward in a way in which we would not have the risk of uh, nuclear war. That risk mm -hmm. uh, has continued because so far we have not abolished nuclear weapons. We've made various treaties. We've put testing underground. At the same time, a great many activists around the world, including the Baksha, who are the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, have taken to the UN our call for a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, so to abolish nuclear weapons. And that has been signed by 93 countries and ratified by 70 countries around the world, and Canada is not one of them. We are so graced to have people from different parts of the world joining us and, and different uh, religions, different you know spiritual practices, and different locations. Uh, I think some seven from outside India and the balance from in Canada, but as far as BC, Ontario. We do have a young woman, for example, who will be speaking uh, on disarmament. She works on that subject. She's a McGill University student, and she's our youth leader uh, going from school to school to speak about disarmament. This is the first high school in Canada, and as far as I know, the world that is nuclear weapons free zone. As we move into one of our last things, uh, one of our last activities together, um, we're really just hoping you guys are taking away from this a little bit about the history of nuclear weapons and how change is happening right now. You know, nobody, uh, I don't know, put up your hand. Do you guys think about the Roman Empire a lot? Yeah, you do. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, you too, uh, history teacher? 
Yeah. Okay, lots of things. Uh, people in the Roman Empire, people in various hit points of history, throughout history, you know, when you're in a time period, you don't really think the world is going to change. You think that's the way the world will always be. Nobody thought the Roman Empire would end. And I don't know if you were aware, but the Pugwash High School uh, declared itself in, as a nuclear-free high school. And so we're starting our march from a nuclear-free high school. It's from his end, it's not from here. And coming from India, we've seen so much of that. Unless you built a just system, peace will come only through police and force. A just system can provide peace automatically. My wife, Jill, she is working with me in India for the last 30, 30 years. And she was trying to learn the, the, the art and science of uh, what you call nonviolent social movement building. But then she said, probably there is something from Gandhi that I can take there. And, uh, and what is that part of Gandhi? The walk. Without people's participation, you can't remove poverty. Without people's participation, you can't end violence. Without people's participation, you can't end discrimination. And without people's participation, you can't address climate crisis. I have yet to meet a citizen who's, who's not actually in the peace movement, who understands that 50% of the Canadian budget is going into the defense budget. And cities and provinces are just starved for money to create the affordable housing transit systems and the emergent, emergent desperate need for healthcare as our population ages. So I think talking about where our taxpayers' money actually goes is a really important task for all of us, that it's destructive of the environment, it's our taxpayers' money, and the world we want to live in is a peaceful one that where everyone has their social needs met, and that that's possible. That's really possible. <laughs> it's a movement that can really illuminate, I think, what is wanted and can raise these issues as we move into the federal elections and call for a, a peace agenda and a social justice agenda and a climate change agenda and show that Canada could take the lead in the world. Canada could be a peacekeeping leader and all those military jobs could go into peacekeeping jobs. All that money that's destroying the Arctic and destroying is being sold through the States to Israel could go into creating affordable housing and affordable transportation. It's very simple. The, those are taxpayers' dollars. We need to say this is the way we want our money spent. We do not want to be aiding and abetting racist, genocidal wars. Walking is one of the ways to connect people because you're on the road and you're always going to encounter people. And nature is always there, so it's always encounter with nature and animals and plants. But the humans is really we can understand and share. So it's one of the great platform to have friendship with people, unknown people. Because there is no chance that you're going to meet them. But this is the best place to connect because you're walking selflessly. So when people meet you, they see you uh, as very different form. And they welcome their home, their space, in their life. They open up what they want, what they need, what they experience. And when they see us like walking selflessly, they become so, yeah. open and they become so kind. So they always want to offer you something. And also sharing a message with them, it, it creates a big impact. Because it's not just talking, it's action. We are doing action. 
So they associate our thought with the walking action. This was the view CDC came out to take of us. They came out and saw us on this road yeah. and did some footage. Yeah, we had CDC. You to ask we... yourself, is there anything more important than peace? Is there anything more important than inner peace? Peace between you and your partner, you and your children, peace in your community, peace in our world. So how do you build up that moral power? And how do you, you know, get a system which you're confronting, which is very difficult. How do you show that moral power, especially if the other side has is amoral or doesn't really subscribe to a morality or a basic sense of ethics, which I mean by justice. How we can press the government of Canada to sign the test ban treaty. There's something called the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And we are wanting to see Canada sign that treaty. We brought the Gandhian notion of nonviolence into this march in order to not just see nuclear weapons as something that happens in the negotiations at the United Nations but it is something that is in our everyday reality. And so people have to find what is the violence in their everyday reality and how to stop it and, and find the linkages of that violence to militarization, to war, to certain attitudes that are war um, directed. There are two things that are distinctive about Gandhi's nonviolent social action. One is it is preventative, okay, and not um, spontaneous. In other words, a nonviolent social action should prevent violence because once violence erupts, it's very hard to contain it. But before it erupts, you can contain it, right? So it has to be preventative. So you know, a lot of people here will talk about nonviolent social action at the time that there is a re reaction to an issue, okay? To hold anger and channel it in a positive and rational way, as opposed to a reactive and emotional way, which often leads a, a, um, a struggle to go in the wrong direction. And uh, this is the kind of training that I've been engaged in for many, many years, is training young people how not to be reactive, to hold their passion, which is important. Anger is fundamental in fighting injustice, but not losing that anger and dispersing it keeping it and channeling it into a social action, which is strategic and leads them closer to their goal. That's the bridge. There's no end to help us from the yeah. dark bridge today. And all along my journey, I've been going through a healing journey at the same time and guiding and meeting a whole new family. I am now global. Watch out. Um, I have to say there's a lot of different things that went on during our trip and that helped, I think, a lot of us be educated on each other and know our similar differences make part of who we are and what a group we are we can move mountains but first i got to get my uh unceded territory landmarks and stuff made okay next trip i'm gonna give you the marion sister going in and we see 
uh, Marion. And Megama is a little for a little Marion. <clears throat> I'm so honored for this walk. 200 kilometers was really nothing for me. I could have ran it. I could have walked it. I could have crawled it. I could have flew it. Um, I was so honored to lead as a as a grandmother, as a mother, as a sister, as a niece, someone's daughter, to lead all nations from Sidnogma across on Sidnogma territory. These are happy tears. It was hard. It was soft. We built a family. We all lift each other up. We kept rising us each day. Look at us today. We're up here. I honor to walk you guys across my rivers to my streams. The journey I have walked two years ago, I walked a thousand kilometers right across Nova Scotia praying for the water. Backtracking it again. It was a beautiful trail to show the global how much water is so important to us. With peace and this big word over there, sister. She's referring to colonization. And so today's the day we're going to what, sister? We're going to decolonize, demilitarize, and decarbonize. Water is life in Setnogama right across the globe. We are I'm so honored to go welcome you guys to Onsi the Mi'kmaq territory of Chibuktuk. And I'm so honored. I got you guys here safe. Honest. We're gonna get in the face of the wind and the fire. We're gonna get in. Love makes the journey a beautiful race. Close to home with its every day. We're gonna get in. Well, my apologies for uh, the technical glitches. It's, uh, Zoom has uh, really changed, and uh, I wasn't quite sure how to fix it all the time. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And and what I can do is also put the um, the link, the YouTube link in the chat. So if people want to share it or perhaps even watch it again, um, that'll be possible. That would be great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chase, it's a wonderful record. Thank you. And I just want to say that that the Mekamah grassroots grandmothers, you heard from them at the end of the film. And as Marion said, she led us um, with her drum and um, was very familiar with the land we were walking across. It's Mi'kma'ki land. And uh, it was really wonderful for us to be welcomed by um, Amy and Marion and we were able to visit in their homes in Indian Brook, and we um, we just felt they they considered us family by the end, and we felt uh, that was a wonderful form of reconciliation. I, I felt yes, I almost got a heart there. I just think that was so special um, about our walk. Um, do we have any questions for Jace, or should we just carry on? Jace, can you stay with us till later? Um, because we have a couple more speakers and then we we're gonna have more discussion. Or do you want to take is that okay? Okay, that's good enough. All right. So um I think that we're going to hear from you, I believe, Jill, at this point. 
Yeah, and then and then Joy, going to the order, right? It's not opening for me now. Actually. Yes, well, good evening, everybody. I met, uh, I think, midnight here in Europe. <laughs> so uh, have had a nice, um, a nice beverage to keep me awake and be with you. I just want to say how happy I am that uh, Science for Peace and VOW has created this opportunity for us to share and to see all of uh, all of you uh, coming to be part of this uh, program. Um, the part I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about was the really the global solidarity, however small, I think it was significant that the Nova Scotia March for Peace uh, enabled a uh, set of marches to go on in India at the same time. There were 55 uh, of them uh, that uh, happened between the 11th and the 21st of, um, of uh, September. So practically the same duration that we were walking and of those uh, 55 walks, uh, they traveled through 1300 villages in India. So these walks all talked about global peace. They all raised the issue of too much money going into military production, militarization, and uh, not enough money going into development and uh, development that was necessary for reducing poverty uh, and for uh, mitigating or uh, working on the climate issues of, in India. They also, each of these 55 marches raised in the many media reports that came out, which we saw later, uh, that they were doing this in solidarity with Canadians in Nova Scotia. And I think what this uh, raises for us uh, as a group, but I would very much like your feedback, is that we can build a... So global is not just going to the UN and working on treaties only. It's also horizontal solidarity, which brings together citizens movements, citizens actions groups across borders around one issue. Because nuclear disarmament is global, it requires uh, so many countries to provide support. Because India also has not signed the TPNW, as Canada has not signed it. Because India and Canada are potentially countries that can do peacemaking, that have histories of peace, uh, it is, uh, I think, paramount that these kinds of global solidarity movements converge. And I think from the Indian side, there was much greater awareness uh, that uh, was created when these 55 marches spanned out over seven provinces or states. And uh, they uh, went from village to village. Each march had roughly 100 people. Uh, and they each went to more than 35 villages each. So they were doing education and grassroots mobilization in the same way we were trying to do it in Nova Scotia. And uh, I, I saw that the news coverage was fairly extensive. They had 191 articles that came out in the... Um, print media, 
77 in the electronic uh, media, totaling 268 uh, different um, uh, pieces of information uh, in the mainstream media, not to mention there was also social media. So in a way, this strengthens us both in terms of having this global solidarity link, but also having a group that has had uh, a lot of experience with these marches to uh, model how they were able to work with the media effectively. And uh, the media in India is also extremely uh, uh, difficult to engage in discussions on global peace and militarization, but some of that happened and we need to build on it. So it seems to me that the Canadian uh, peace groups, the 10 which supported this, and we have heard uh, from Ellen, from Wilf, and uh, Lynn from Vow, and uh, we have seen Leah in yeah. the film from IPPNW, um, and, um, and Linda from Science for Peace. The, you know, the coming together of these peace groups uh, has been a very, very significant in terms of, of creating solidarity in different parts of Canada. I think we're at the beginning of that process. As Ellen said, there is lots more we can do. And uh, I think it's extremely exciting. So my takeaway and what I wanted to communicate with you, uh, the takeaway that I saw as so valuable is the beginning of building and forging more global solidarity so that we can use that to press our governments, the Canadian government, uh, and uh, press uh, the UN um, uh, advocates, advocacy groups from Canada who are working day and night to try to bring this issue uh, forward. Uh, we use this uh, solidarity actions uh, as a way to say that nonviolence, peace uh, are not uh, uh, invisible. In fact, people are extremely concerned and by giving them channels and ways of acting, this brings up um, a huge uh, force which can be used positively. So I just wanted to share a little bit of that information with you. And again, thank all the peace groups for coming together and making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Okay, uh, at this point, uh, we've, I'm turning to Joy uh, Masahara, Dr. Joy Masahara, who joined us on the walk, and she's going to uh, guide us or share with us a few reflections um, on learnings from the walk, um, and then we'll have a QA and a after that. Um, over you, to you, Joy. Great. Um, thank you, Lynn. And um, I'll, I'll share a bit of my my own learnings and reflections on the walk, uh, but I know there's others here who were on the walk, uh, and so I invite them to also uh, be able to share some of their reflections as well, um, uh, leaving enough time for, for questions, et, et cetera. So I'll, I'll be short. I'll, I'll just say this was a um, really remarkable experience for me personally. Um, it was challenging in many, many ways, uh, both physically, emotionally, etc. cetera, uh, but I gained so much from it. And yeah, I, you know, I could, I could probably talk for hours about this, but anyway, um, this was not an easy, an easy undertaking. Um, you know, we, we had many different organizations coming together, many different groups coming together, people from different cultures, 
different geographies, um, you know, different worldviews, etc. It wasn't always peaceful. Uh, and there was a lot of organizing, and thank you to all those who, who did organizing, uh, both in Nova Scotia and then from, from Toronto, the Toronto group, and then the Indian group as well, Jill, Jill's uh, um, work, work as well. Um, and yeah, th this was a, compl a complicated thing to, to, pull, to pull off. Uh, and, you know, there's many lessons that, that, that came through. The um, on the ground experience of of you know being led by our indigenous grandmothers who you saw in the film. Um, this was an incredible learning and challenge for all of us. Um, we, you know, there. I think this was a, a, an unexpected gift that we received of of having them come. Uh, and when when I think back on how uh, we could have maybe done this better. We, we all could have um, been more prepared, all of us, uh, um, not including, including our Indigenous grandmothers, um, to, to be able to understand each other a, a little bit ahead of time, uh, know where some of the um, tensions might arise and work work through work through some of them um, but at the same time i would say you know th this this was an incredible incredible gift i learned so much from them uh just walking beside them listening listening to their stories understanding their uh perspectives um and then you know stepping back hearing about the the incredible work done in india um by the by the indian group that when Nitin, who you also saw in the film, talked about this selfless approach, they go out on their walks. Um, and the, 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 they actually started, <laughs> just after they finished our walk, started a walk from Seattle to San Francisco. Uh, and they start with really nothing. They go, you know, um, with the understanding that people will be kind along the way. And that people will show their kindness when they see what what they're doing, uh, and that happens. It's it's really incredible. I learned so much just walking just walking alongside them, and if you can imagine our indigenous grandmother drumming at the at the head of our our uh, um, you know walkers, and then we had the Japanese Buddhist monk who was just incredible, chanting the entire way. So sometimes that was eight, nine hours a day that he chanted. And um, I, I don't think you got an opportunity to hear it too much on the, on the film because of the audio, but uh, this was an incredible gift. Every time we went past a field of cows, all the cows would actually stop and stare at us. <laughs> it, was, it was really quite amazing. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, like I said, I, there, there's lots to learn about how we could do it, how we could do it better, what we could improve on, how we could improve our logistics, how we could communicate better, uh, how we could prepare ourselves better. Uh, and we will take all those learnings away and, and uh, apply them to our, to our next big adventure. Uh, and I think we'll have a bit of time to be able to talk about some things that we can do to keep the, keep the momentum going, keep this uh, focus on peace in the world rather than some of the things we're hearing about every single day um, and how we can do that together how we can how we can bring hope how we can receive hope that's one of the things that we saw in the peace caravan going across the country to Ottawa and on this walk and just the incredible uh, kindness of everyone in in Nova Scotia I want to pass it over to Catherine and Sue our our, our two Nova Scotians here uh, uh, who, if you want to, you know, no pressure, but if you want to say a few words, we also, I know I saw Jane in the back there as well um, in Toronto and Jace, if you want to add a few more words, uh, Huguette is still here. Yeah. With us as well. If you want to, to, you, you joined us at, um, uh, for part of the walk as well. So if any of you want to add a few words, your reflections, lessons for yourself. Catherine, we'll need to be allowed to be on mute. 
someone can let her um, unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Joy, for the invitation to share some of the reflections of the walk. And uh, I echo much of what you have said. We brought together a very unique situation here in Nova Scotia. And what I would just like to, to say, since Sue is here and Julie as well, that the support, the local support of Nova Scotia Voice of Women for Peace was really astounding and a cornerstone of the success of this uh, wonderful walk together, as are all the people that are involved, including everyone on this call, because this peace work doesn't begin and start when we took those first steps in Pugwash. It is a long story that most of you here have had as part of your narrative, being um, advocates for peace, advocates for a better way for all of us in this generation and the next and the next. So I, I do want to acknowledge the wonderful connections um, at the grassroots level, because as Rajaji mentioned, this is where nonviolence starts, where it holds the world accountable and where we can connect in communities of care. And we experienced that en route. I also really want to thank um, the, the the local support in terms of the places where we stayed and the food, as was mentioned. And, um, and that was all heartwarming and really shows us that that change comes in the small ways and it, it, it gains momentum. You know, the, the peace train that's coming up won't be the last, we'll have more. This walk won't be the last. There are walks that will continue that are continuing now. So uh, it was an honor to be part of that. And I really thank the people of Nova Scotia, the beautiful land that we walked on here in Mi'kma'ki and, uh, and all of those who've been part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Sue has uh, put a little note in the chat. If people want to read, read that because they're, um, she mentions the really strong drumming of Akeda and the and Marion, uh, you know this really strong heartbeat. It's true; those those drums were were a real heartbeat for the walk. Um, so thank you, Sue. Anyone else want to say any anything? You get uh, Jane, Jace. Jace, Jace looks like he wants to say something. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I needed to be unmuted by the, your end once again. Um, I just want to say um, how important uh, I think it is to share progressive media with people. People that I know who are on the right page in terms of uh, wanting peace and wanting justice for people, for the planet, um, some of them, they, when I try to talk to them, they kind of look at me initially like I'm a little bit loopy or something like that. And then I'll share um, something from some progressive news site or another. Uh, you know, I think it's important to, to pick the ones that you think people might be actually um, open to what is being said. And, and, then they, and then they'll come back to me sometime later and say, oh yeah, Okay, I didn't know that. And, you know, one of the challenges, I think, you know, I mean, amongst those who are here, we're probably all pretty much on the same page. But, you know, I heard, I, I actually um, attended a webinar uh, put on by the Council of Canadians a couple of days ago. And probably the most brilliant thing that was said was that, if you're only talking to people who agree with you, you're talking to the wrong people. And, and so how do you find a way to talk to people that you're not on the same page with? Personally, as much as it might be tempting to be, uh, you know, um, assertive and perhaps overly assertive with that, to me, gentleness and 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 respecting their difference is the way to go so i just wanted to say that thank you thank you thank you jace i noticed that uh i know i had one experience of that uh walking with someone who just you know uh 
randomly joined the walk for a little for a little bit uh, and was talking about you know the the their uh, association with the military uh, in in Nova Scotia and we had an interesting talk about uh, you know military military spending and NATO etc and you know like you say if, if it's done in a a way of peace you know at wanting the same you know kind of wanting the same thing of peace uh, there, there was a there was a way to be able to to understand each other. Um, I see hands up, Moji. I hope I said the name yes. right. Yes. Hi. Um, this is Moji Aga, and I am from in Boulder, Colorado. I'm an Iranian American, peace and human rights and climate change, and in in one word, civility activist. And my undergraduate degree. Uh, was from Canada, from McGill University. The first two years, I went to Nova Scotia Agricultural College. And this is 1977 to 1979. So the, I've been listening to this wonderful presentation. And the question that the gentleman asked about how we can talk to people who are not just the same you know, the choir, not how not to preach to the choir, the project that I have, I am pursuing, which began in 2013 as Circles of Nonviolence is now called Chambers of Compassion. In the same way that corporations have, have this entity in each community that, that is called the Chamber of Commerce, we, as different tribes of civility activists, peace, justice, environment, human rights, you know, so, you know, whatever our good cause, we are siloed in our groups talking to people that like to hear the, you know, people that believe like they believe. Therefore, we don't have a synergy across geography and and we don't have synergy across cause so the work of a climate change activist and the work of a peace activist for example would add to each other's impact so that then we can have the critical mass that is needed in order to push especially the american government to be to not spend $1.1 trillion every year in military slash intelligence, as opposed to on climate change and human needs. So I just, uh, the, the answer, my answer, if I may, to that question of how can we, how can we uh, talk to people who don't believe in the exactly the same way as we, we believe, is to build the infrastructure for systemic collaboration across cause, hence what I call intersectional circles or chambers of compassion. And I can send a link to this project in the chat if people are interested. Sorry if I talk too long. That was great. Thank you. And put your um, the link in the chat. That would be great. There's a mention of banners and buttons, and we did have our banners and buttons, and um, also in the uh, petition um, for the treaty for, for the prohibition of nuclear weapons with us. So I think we're. we're Ellen, Ellen oh, has yes. her. Ellen, oh, has, Ellen her. has her hand up. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, I, I think of the the seeds, the seeds of the watermelon, the seeds of the ceasefire movement that have taught us all that 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 what we've been doing is scattering seeds for peace, for climate change, for uh, decolonization. And I think that I was in on the call that Jace was in a couple of days ago. There were many, many people there talking about the upcoming federal election. And how do we build local coalitions? How do we build national coalitions? How do we learn to make our language simple and accessible in a way for 
many, many people to participate in different ways because we've just gone through a provincial election and um, we need to learn how to speak to people where their needs are and show how this is a way forward in a broad-based coalition. Thank you, Ellen. And um, I, we're near, nearly at our time, I would say. I think we've got an hour and a half and we're getting close to it. Um, and uh, Catherine has added something more about our um, disarmament education um, program while we went. Um, there were six elementary classrooms in two high schools uh, that were visited. And I think uh, we heard a little bit about the high school from um, Linda before and um, others of us were involved. And as Catherine says, they were uh, producing letters and artwork at these schools to go to Senator McFedrin in Ottawa uh, for the prime minister. So we really brought with us the sense that we were going to take people's concerns to, um, to Ottawa, to Parliament, and uh, we hope to present the petitions that we are collecting as well today. Uh, sometime in November to um, uh, in the House of Commons. Um, so this is an opportunity for questions and answers. So we have a few minutes if people or comments, if people would like to share who weren't part of it, but to have been here for the presentation. Um, I want to say that we're very grateful for the support from Science for Peace and, and the, the many other organizations that contributed um, to covering our logistical costs for for this very special journey. Okay, are there any um, comments, questions? Um, uh, anything people may say? I, I definitely want to say, oh, okay, Richard's got one. Go ahead. Yes, hello, my name is Richard Sandbrook. And uh, <clears throat> what we've heard tonight is very inspiring. But I thought we would be spending more time on follow up. That is to say, <clears throat> it's really important that. Of the walking for peace is not a singular event that, that happens and then fades as part of some longer term strategy or plan. And I guess we haven't really got to that part yet, but it's a very, very important one. I mean, Lynn did mention the petition going to Ottawa, so that is one follow up. But I'm wondering what beyond that is on the agenda. Thank you for bringing us to that. Um, Ellen has some follow-up steps that are happening. I think uh, as well, Jill might want to to add. Joy or um, okay. shall, shall I enter? Uh, Joy unfortunately had to uh, leave. Um, but one of the things that we came back and Joy was so empowered by the walk that she came up with this idea that we start doing short walks, like five kilometers, and then stop and have a cup of tea with people, just like we used to stop every 5K along the Nova Scotia walk and talk about what we are, you know, the issues of um, carbon, you know, the three Ds. Uh, and then we could walk another 5K for those people who were able but that we start to do these local neighborhood walks and draw in some of the local neighbors, uh, as well as, of course, join the ceasefire rallies and other um, issues that people are working on, whether it's it, the climate change rallies where we take our banners, but now we can take our banners and take the new experiences we've gained over this past period of time and then build towards a major walk for peace that we all take part in, in the spring. Thank you. And Julie. I'd like to uh, certainly say thanks to everyone who was involved. I had a, the opportunity to be in Halifax for the, the uh, event on the 21st. Um, I have uh, two, one, one point and then um, a, a suggestion. Uh, the point is uh, in the town of Wolfville in the Annapolis Valley here in Nova Scotia, there is a weekly peace vigil where about half a dozen people stand outside the post office on a Saturday for 
um, an hour. And it's been going for 30 years as of last year. Uh, and uh, excuse me, as of last week. And uh, they don't miss a single Saturday. Uh, and uh, sometimes people will come and speak. Sometimes people will beep their horns or do thumbs up. Um, sometimes there's no reaction. But I think I think that sort of action to make peace visible, but not uh, not um, sort of in your face, is another complementary approach to uh, to building that peace agenda. Um, the suggestion I have is uh, I'm I'm really excited to hear that you the group went and talked to students and. I think that it's important to try to continue that and maybe maybe here in Nova Scotia get some more schools to become nuclear free schools uh, and people who uh, are you know peace activists who are attending TPNW for example can uh, can maybe if there's ways to get into the schools can maybe give presentations uh, and uh, follow through with that but the other side of it is also looking at uh, adult education and look at lifelong learning groups. And so you're talking to young people, but you're also talking to uh, older retired people. Uh, and I would make those, those two suggestions for uh, certainly for the local group to consider, Catherine, <laughs> but also, uh, also just other, other groups for peace activism. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. And I see, okay, Mochi, did you want to say a final word? You said, please contact me. Do you want to put your email in the in the uh, chat? I, 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 I will put that. The, what I, the, the picture that, that uh, the one, this wonderful lady uh, drew of the a few people standing for 30 years, week after week. Uh, in the US, I have stood at the corner of, I call Hope and Fear Street for so long, for so many years that as a social scientist, as a psychologist and, and, and whatever, my background, I asked, like, why does this number grow? How come it's the same hardy group of people at the corner of Hope and Fear Street year after year holding the same basic signs, asking for basic morality, basic civility? How come this doesn't grow? So I said, wow, this is a systemic problem. So I began thinking about systemic solution and then I reached out to Noam Chomsky, which I have the honor of having having worked with him. And and when when he heard about what I was doing, he endorsed it immediately. Also, Erica Chenowet, Professor Erica Chenowet, the three point five percent lady, as some people call her, she's another another um, uh, endorser of this project. We need to defrag. If people know what defragging is, defrag the civil society. Our civil society, whether in Canada, in the US, and even in Iran, where the, the regime does not allow the civil society to get to get formed, really, they as long as we are fragmented into our own little, you know, often causes often little causes, uh, we won't have the 3.5%. In the US, there is 3.5% and more, except it is spread all over the country. Hence the Chambers of Compassion as, a, as an entity that is, has a different kind of, you know, value at its center, i.e. compassion, as opposed to Chambers of Commerce, 
and the chambers of commerce are phenomenally successful. Mm. So I'll I'll put the same thing in the chat again and and please contact me. Um, thank, you. thank you. Sorry if I talked too much. Thank you, Moti. Your uh, energy behind that outreach is really visible and appreciated. So thank you for sharing that. You get, and then I think we'll have to wrap I'm up. A, by the way, I'm a Sufi monk, by the way. I'm a Muslim Sufi monk and a dervish. And I am a Muslim member of the Jewish Voice for Peace, for example. Okay. And also a member mm -hmm. of Veterans for Peace. Crossing uh, boundaries. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. The thank you. Okay. I hope All right. you get. Okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, just, I just want a few words. First of all, um, I am very grateful for all the organizers that did so much work for this walk. I was able to join at the, you know, towards the end, and I had the privilege to, to be able to do that. So what I would like, also, I agree with everything that has been said. And I think from my point of view at IPPNW, um, we want to really emphasize the education part. So I also agree with Julie about not only children, but also uh, adults and older people. But I think the children is the future and that's really, I hope we can expand this education. And, and this Sunday, I'm going to be talking with our youth and uh, see if I, if I can um, if I can get them to talk to their own school so that we can go in, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you so much, everyone. I think that that yeah. really is. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. We do have a disarmament education uh, working group between Voice of Women for Peace and the IPPNW, that's International Positions for Prevention of Nuclear War. Uh, so that's an ongoing educational outreach, and Linda is involved in this too, uh, working on curriculum. So it's definitely to try and get curriculum into schools across the country. That is the goal of that of that um, outreach program. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, there's so many ways that we could uh, reach out. Uh, Nocturne is the the, the all night art program that takes place in in uh, Halifax and. Uh, Voice of Women from Nova Scotia had um, an exhibit there where it was an interactive activity where people could make a boat and they could put it in the harbor of peace or the harbor of war. It created two harbors and uh, I, I just got the general intro, but I could imagine how that would be great activity and it's totally new people because it's a, uh, an art exhibit in the community. So those kinds of uh, innovative ideas, we need to nurture them and share them and uh, learn from them because we can't just keep all of this yearning for peace that we have and all of the work that we're doing on on how to get there to our own our own groups That's so okay. um yes yeah, so i know that science for peace did all the hosting for today the um, zoom hosting the setup here at friends house i'm very grateful to um to uh, and also to Richard and to Jorge for um, organizing the event for today. Some of our folks are in Ottawa because the next couple of days there is gathering of Pugwash Canada and also um, Canadian CNANW. The, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, our organization against nuclear weapons, just blanking out on the full name, but CNANW, and those meetings will be happening. Um, and so all of this work that we're doing is going to permeate uh, various groups with which we connected in advance of and during the walk. Uh, it was amazing for me to see Pugwash, you know, that community I've heard so much about, to actually be there, to stay in the Thinker's Lodge. We were hosted there at no cost to our um, to our initiative. Um, and uh, it, it, it's absolutely like a museum in there with all the all the history um, and, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful uh, record, again, of the yearning for peace that in that case, the scientists brought to, to there and started this work on containing and reducing the risk of nuclear weapons. And it's obviously really crucial that we, we do so in an even more um, organized way. Um, at this time, 
and most Canadians have not heard about it. So this was a good way to start getting out there. So I'm going to have to start talk, stop talking and draw this all to a close. Um, so again, thanks to Melissa for uh, the hosting. Any other thank yous we should have? Uh, thank you to those who've come here in person and those who have joined us online. Um, we will be uh, also reporting back to Voice of Women AGM on November 30th. So that, that will be coming up another opportunity. And uh, we're ha happy to hear um, feedback uh, and further ideas from anyone. And I, I guess what I'll do is put my email in the chat and feel free to get in touch. Anything else that everybody knows we should talk about now? And if not, Melissa's going to save the chat. We so did. Then you and I discussed um, everyone doing something on November 11th for remember. Yes. yes. We, actually, the, yes. Unit, the Unitarian in Vancouver has a, a, a white white poppy ceremony. Yeah. And yeah. we'll be following it with um, a table and discussions and with, with everyone on okay, peace. This White coffee event will be happening in Toronto as well, but um, I would like to add to it a die-in about Gaza. So that would be my uh, hope that we could do that. And I will yeah. also mention, as we're talking about future, is that Jill has this wonderful idea that we do a festival, a youth festival in Toronto, as they do um, in India and other parts of the world. She knows a youth organizer. They do a peace and nonviolence festival that's all creative and artistic and theater and music and so forth for young people. So we'll be looking into whether that can be done, possibly for next year on the days of nonviolence around Gandhi's birthday, October 1st to 5th. Gandhi's birthday is October 2nd. But there will be so much happening between now and then. So November 11th will be one of those things that is happening. Okay. Did you want to say something, Ron? I, I mean, there's so many good ideas. I'm, I'm very inspired. Yeah. The one thing I remember Val was always doing every year, we had um, out in the street, uh, right in the most uh, busy area, yeah. you know, containers, and we'd ask people to choose where they wanted the budget, the federal money yeah. to go. And, and it made people think, you know. Yes, that, you're, you're right. And we, that, that's yeah. another way, you know, bringing people in that don't necessarily have any connection yeah. to peace movement or anything. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, aside from children, which is the most important to get to the kids. And, and I think everybody yeah. agrees with that. So I don't schools. Did everybody hear, Ronnie? It's about these, we have done this activity before where we put out jars for health, education, um, climate action, etc. And the military is one of the jars, and we give people a loony, uh, your quarter, whatever, some coin, and say, put that where you would like to see government money invested. Um, and it gets people to think about the fact that we make a choice as to where our money goes, or government makes a choice for us. And um, that is also a great activity. Maybe we could do that again. Um, Someone else yeah. had also talked about peace dinners. Someone in our group, I can't remember. Yeah. Peace meal, peace dinners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had peace walking, we had peace dinners. Um, uh, Richard. Well, I mean, I was just reflecting in the last few minutes on the number of strategic uh, challenges we face. And one of the biggest ones, so people mentioned, is the difficulty of uh, creating unity among a fragmented civil society. Um, you know, the peace movement, there are so many small movements, let alone in the climate movement and so on. Uh, and I think, therefore, that the, one of the biggest intellectual priorities should be a way of, of interrelating the various crises. I mean, there is this talk about multi-crisis, you know, how various crises uh, fit together, and uh, including the pandemics and problem pandemics, the climate change, nuclear war or poverty, a, a, a way of understanding how they interact so that you can easily um, talk to people about how their own interest relates to the larger interest in human survival. I mean, that's the real strategic challenge we, we face at the moment. We need a TV program. Yeah. Generally, that kind of 
Yes, well, uh, an excellent suggestion, Ronnie's saying we need a TV <laughs> program. Well, it could be a radio program. I know that there is an environmental radio program on on the yeah. Toronto Alternative Radio yeah. show every Friday morning at 11, so we could try to set up a peace broadcast too. Um, okay, so I thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today, and I think we can stop recording. And um, the recording, uh, there's recording, and we'll also have the chat. This is